hot topic at the time of publication, Germany has exited nuclear power. This means getting rid of nuclear power plants, but unfortunately it's a bit more complicated than just bulldozing them down. Even nuclear power plants are built with concrete, but the concrete near the reactor itself is exposed to a very high neutron flux during reactor operation, and it eventually becomes significantly radioactive. This will remain so for a very long time. This naturally complicates decommissioning because one must assess whether this concrete has been activated to levels above acceptable limits and needs to be disposed of as radioactive waste or if it can be disposed conventionally. This decision has to be made with a sample measurement. For this a chemical separation based on a sample needs to happen beforehand so that the actual measurement can take place using accelerator mass spectrometry. But what makes this concrete radioactive in the first place? First of all it's not ordinary concrete but it's barite concrete which means it contains an addition of barium sulfate. Concrete consists of calcium containing compounds and since it includes rocks it also contains some transition elements. Calcium mostly exists as calcium 40. Through a neutron activation in an N gamma reaction with a cross section of approximately 0.4 barns calcium 41 an electron capture nuclide with a half life of just over 100,000 years is produced. Since it's barite concrete barium 132 is also activated to barium 133. The goal is to isolate only only the calcium because during the release measurement the calcium 41 to calcium 40 ratio is determined. To this concrete sample there was also some potassium 40 added. More on that later. For this we need 4 molar hydrochloric acid, 6 molar sodium hydroxide solution, 0.2 molar sodium carbonate solution, 4 molar sulfuric acid and concentrated hydrofluoric acid. And here's a note on how dangerous hydrofluoric acid is. Hydrofluoric acid is extremely toxic and must be handled with the utmost respect. Hydrofluoric acid can penetrate the skin, enter the bloodstream and damage the electrolyte balance and might cause you to, well, die if it's not handled properly. It's kind of fortunate that we are using 40% concentration where the contact should be noticeable due to chemical burns on your hand. Because hydrofluoric acid is so toxic we don't work without calcium gluconate ointment nearby. The calcium in it binds the fluoride ions as water insoluble and harmless calcium fluoride. Now back onto the topic we also need radioactive concrete. Initially 500 milligrams are weighted. To show that there really is barium 133 in there we can measure it using the gamma spectrometer and see the barium 133 lines. All these lines should disappear after our chemical processing. So first the concrete is completely dissolved in hydrochloric acid. Caution since there are carbonates gas production will be observed. Once the concrete has dissolved transition metals are separated by hydroxide precipitation. A pH of 9 should be achieved during this step. If the solution is too basic calcium would also precipitate as calcium hydroxide. Therefore pH paper is consistently checked and adjusted drop by drop with hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide solution. Then into the centrifuge with a counterweight 3000 rpm for 5 minutes should be enough. In the meantime the pH paper can also be disposed of. Everything is measured before throwing it away. If it's not contaminated the paper snippets can be collected into a nitrile glove and be thrown out in the non-active flammable waste. The now transition metal free supernatant is carefully decanted off. Now the volume of the solution is determined, in this case it is 3 milliliters. And then so much sodium carbonate is weighted out that a 0.2 molar solution is created. 63.6 milligrams in this case. By adding sodium carbonate the alkaline earth metals including barium 133 and calcium 41 are precipitated as carbonates and can then be separated from the alkali metals. I will explain why that is important later in the theory. The supernatant with dissolved alkali metal ions can carefully be decanted off and the alkaline earth carbonate solid is then washed again with 0.2 molar sodium carbonate solution. Centrifuged again and the supernatant can be decanted off again. The solid is dissolved in hydrochloric acid again. Caution of course we have a carbonate so gas production will be observed.
And now to separate the barium, also the barium-133, from the calcium, a few drops of sulfuric acid are added. We have a barium sulfate precipitate which can be centrifuged off and to ensure that there really is no barium in the solution left, you can add one to two drops of sulfuric acid. If nothing precipitates, the calcium containing solution can be decanted into another centrifuge tube. Now hydrofluoric acid comes into play. In this case, acid resistant gloves are needed, which I will put over my nitrile gloves. So the precipitation as calcium fluoride with one milliliter of hydrofluoric acid really wasn't that impressive, but after you centrifuged it off, you can clearly see a calcium fluoride residue. The upper hydrofluoric acid rich phase can be pipetted off, the residue is then washed with distilled water, the suspension is then transferred into an Appendorf tube and centrifuged again. The pipettes and the centrifuge tubes can go into the solid waste bin. One pipette has seen hydrofluoric acid, so I will wear these acid resistance gloves in order to protect myself. Since the open Eppendorf with the moist calcium fluoride is still wet, it's briefly dried and placed then onto the gamma spectrometer. And as we can see, there are no barium-133 lines anymore. Lab work is done, so we can leave the lab and go on to the evaluation. The following questions will be answered. Why the addition of potassium-40? Adding on to that, how is the calcium-40, calcium-41 ratio determined? And with some information about calcium-41, we can also answer why this clearance measurement that we just did is such a pain. So the two radionuclides calcium-41 and barium-133 primarily arise from the calcium-40 contained in the concrete and the barium-132, which turns into barium-133 in an N-gamma reaction with a cross-section of about 10.5 bonds. Potassium-40 was used in the experiments to check the potassium content in general. But why? Potassium primarily exists as potassium-39 and potassium-41. And this stable potassium-41 messes up our measurement. Since potassium-40 emits radiation nicely, we can track the potassium-41 content of the sample through the measurement of the scintillation counter, which measures the radioactive potassium-40. And the radioactive potassium-40 and potassium-41 are chemically identical. When I decanted the dissolved potassium ions during the carbonate washing step, from the solution, I separated the calcium from all potassium isotopes. But why do I need to separate potassium-41 and potassium-40 from calcium-41? Surprise quiz! What term describes the relation in which the potassium-41 and calcium-41 stand to each other? Exactly, these are isobars, so they have the exact same mass. Perfect transition to the next question, the calcium-40 and calcium-41 content is determined by accelerator mass spectrometry. And isotopes with the same mass would mess up the results. If potassium-41 was present, the mass ratio between 40 and 41 would be shifted towards the 41. And one might think that the concrete is more active than it actually is because of this addition of mass 41 from the potassium 41. Therefore, away with the potassium 41 and also natural amounts of potassium 40. This accelerator mass spectrometer can determine isotope ratios of up to 10 to the power of minus 16. Without a big particle accelerator, your limits would be reached with 10 to the power of minus 7. And now onto the last part, the decay data calcium-41 is an electron capture nuclide. It decays directly into the ground state of potassium-41. You can also check this on the isotope browser, calcium-41 has no gamma lines. This means that the only radiation emitted by calcium-41 are Auger electrons and X-rays, both of which require special equipment. Gamma rays greatly simplify determination of radionuclides, but they are not emitted from calcium-41. So it's a technical challenge to identify it without a particle accelerator. And then there's this half-life of 100,000 years, which means that if calcium-41 is present, you can't just let the calcium in the concrete decay, so it's not radioactive, that would take 1 million years. That's way too long. And with such long half-lives, you can't just let decommissioning material decay away. So calcium-41 is quite a super radionuclide when it comes to decommissioning. Not, no, no, not really. 
So now you have a brief glimpse into how complicated the decommissioning of barite concrete from nuclear power plants is. And with that little insight, goodbye. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons.